Hello and welcome to another session for the Student Undergraduate Research Experience, the SURE program. My name is Dr. Merle Massey. I am the coordinator for undergraduate research initiatives here at the University of Saskatchewan. And I'm so excited for our, our event today with us is Dr. Rachel Lowen Walker. And, and Dr. Rachel is the Ariel F. Solos Chair in Human Rights in the College of Law here at the University of Saskatchewan. And with that, I'm going to turn it right over to, to Dr. Rachel because she's going to tell us about community community-led research and how that's different um, from community-based research. And I'm, I'm just going to be taking notes over in the corner. <laughs> thank you so much, Merle. Um, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, greetings to all from Treaty 6 and Homeland of the Métis. I'm really, um, really happy to be here with you. I, I, I'm going to give you a bit of a background on me and how I ended up in this kind of work in the talk. So I'll leave my introduction to that portion. Um, and then I think we should have, we should have time for questions at the end. Um, so definitely feel and feel free to ask questions throughout if things come up. So everyone can see if you give me a thumbs up if you can see the presentation looks great. Great. Wonderful. And so I am a queer settler. Uh, I grew up on a farm just outside of, uh, just, out, just north of Saskatoon. And I have been deeply shaped by feminist praxis. You'll hear that throughout. Um, and you'll hear that I fundamentally believe that we are who we are because of the worlds in which we are entangled. So my, my life has traveled many paths and I think, I think that has helped shape my motivations and definitely my interest in community-led research. Uh, for example, midway through my degree in philosophy, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a graduate of the University of Saskatchewan and midway through my degree in philosophy and women's and gender studies, I met Dr. Caroline Tate, who is now a professor in psychiatry and the principal investigator of the NEAR Center, I met her at an event, at a women's and gender studies event. And she offered me a job. <laughs> and, uh, and I joined at that time, I think I was 21, joined the Indigenous People's Health Research Center as a research assistant. And so I was in philosophy, very, very humanities focused. But this gave me the opportunity to enter into community research. Um, and I would say that before ever learning about the rich and complicated terrain of community research, um, that, you know, that includes community-based participatory research, grounded theory, and even feminist research methods, before all of that, I learned about Indigenous communities. I learned about why the OCAP principles were so important. I learned about indigenous led research and about knowledge translation and mobilization, which definitively have come from indigenous communities. And now are, are words that we hear much more in many, many different environments. And so I tell you that story because it is this wonderful serendipitous divergence from an intended path that was really a great gift. And it ruptured my educational uh, landscape. It really gave me this opportunity to bring philosophy and theory together with community research and to be deeply shaped by indigenous philosophies and ways of knowing uh, and, and able to weave those into the feminist scholarship that I was working with. So very much in contrast to the philosophy classes that I was in, uh, I was seeing, and I knew this, right, but that we are not brains in vats. That's the big, if anyone has a philosophy background, uh, it's, I mean, it's a big joke, but, but there's the, the exploration, the mind, or the, you know, thought experiment that maybe we're all just minds hooked up matrix style, um, and, and it's something that, uh, that definitely is not, has not been my experience nor my focus in working through the, th the rich value of philosophy and of theory and its entanglement with community work. Um, and so very much so back to that, that entanglement, we are connected to the worlds in which we live. We are bodies in motion and in relation. And so with that, I do love, theory. I love philosophy. I love ideas, imagining possibilities. Um, and it's because of my background in, in the humanities with this work in the social sciences that I feel like I come to these topics a bit sideways. Um, and so I kept, 
I kept up my studies and, and while working and studying almost in, almost in two different worlds, but I did get into some very cool feminist and queer research around temporality, new feminist, feminist materialisms, queer metaphysics. If you don't know what these things are, I'm giving a talk on those next week for Women's and Gender Studies New Feminist Research Series. It will be very different from this one. Um, and I'm happy to share that information later. But um, before, right before I started writing my dissertation in philosophy, and by this time I was at the University of Alberta, uh, I dropped out of my PhD program. And I took a job as the executive director of Out Saskatoon. Uh, and I see that, I think I saw that Crystal is on the call. So Crystal is the current big shout out is the current executive director of, of Out Saskatoon. Um, and, but I just kind of jumped and took this big, this big shift. And so I have um, philosophy, the love of wisdom, the desire to understand ourselves, our worlds and the relationships between them, community being in relation, people connected by shared values, experiences, and identities. And this is why I wanted to work in community. Um, after many years of studying things, I wanted to live them. I wanted to see what it looked like uh, in a different way. And, and also, I mean, of course, working in community is definitely, there's very little time to imagine and postulate about possibilities. And so I would say, after I learned how to read a budget, hire staff, report to a board, so, you know, three years or never, <laughs> my love, three years into the job, my love of research and analysis started to creep back in. I remember I would dig through old reports, all of them that were dusty in a drawer. I would get curious about whether there were other ways that we could be doing things or and start to recognize the things that we weren't doing simply because we couldn't catch a breath. There's not a lot of time in community um, to think and plan and strategize. I also began to experience the other side of the research relationship, the community side, right? And so those reports gathering dust told me that maybe they weren't, uh, that maybe they weren't as useful as the researcher had, had intended. I remember feeling like I was getting so many calls from graduate students and researchers and lots of national surveys. And so that sense of being over-researched. Um, and a great deal, I, I'm, we all know, a great deal of community-based research has been very extractive, even if well-intentioned. And so I, I remembered those OCAP principles, right, which were instituted to, to pave a landscape for Indigenous people to have ownership, control, access, and possession of data. And I thought about what that felt like, what that could look like from the landscape of a queer community center um, at, at Alta Saskatoon. And so this is where, oh, my slide. Praxis, this concept of praxis, and I've always loved this word, um, and it's a word that I think probably lots of people use differently, but the way that I use it is as applied theory informed practice, the interrelatedness of theory and practice. And, and this is where I feel like I, I got to a point where I could take enough of a breath to start looking at where our organization could take ownership. How could we start to lead and guide the process um, and weigh in on some of the research practices that were out there? And so from philosophy to community and back again, um, my philosophy of practice, as I, you know, and this is, I will tell you this, I, I did not have this wonderful philosophy of practice on the wall. I'm not that organized. This is much more of a retroactive reflection on, um, on my experience. But I would say that my philosophy of practice and motivation was less, less grounded in community-based research methodologies. As I said, I didn't have that education. I have never taken a sociology class. I have never taken a psychology class. I'm eternally grateful to the mentors in these fields that have taught me all that I know. Um, but it was my lived experience of philosophy, of working in a two-spirit trans queer community center and a feminist theory. And so that and the, the landscape of community philosophy. And so these principles of, which has the principles of learning through engagement, talking and working with, 
and that's instead of working, talking to work, um, building and building a participatory ethics. And this um, landscape of community philosophy is built on a tradition of philosophy for children. If, if anyone has ever encountered um, the programs called philosophy for children, it's a wonderful, I think Saskatoon might have one. I know the University of Alberta had a really robust program. And it's an opportunity for kids to, to explore ideas and to think and dream and test things out. And, um, and so this concept of community philosophy comes from, comes from that history. Um, and so as I was getting some time and space to be able to venture into these things, one of the first forays that we had at Out Saskatoon was in regards to Pride Home. So Pride Home is a 2S LGBTQ youth home that opened in 2017. And so before ever opening, uh, a professor from the U of S, Nancy Van Stuyvendale, who some of you will know um, and is no longer at the University of Saskatchewan, is now at the University of Alberta. She used to run an internship program. And so she called me up one day and said, hey, I have a student. Um, can she come work with you for the week? And I asked who the student was, and it happened to be a student that I knew um, from my time as teaching a session. I said, you bet, send her over. And so this student did um, some preliminary research and, you know, just jumped on the internet, scanned the country for to see what other queer youth houses there were um, in the province. Spoiler, there were none. Uh, Longtime homes at the time. And, and she gave me a printout of all of the contact information, um, some of the things that were going on in each of those, um, in the in different centers around the country and left me with this really useful piece of information that gave me the tools that I needed to continue that process. Um, key things about this, it helped me start building the case for support for queer youth housing. Uh, and it was based off of, of my ability to set the agenda as the community partner. And so I liked that. I thought this is great. Here we go. Uh, and so then another one, and we ended up doing quite a few things around Pride Home, but another area in which um, out while at Out Saskatoon, we were able to venture into the setting of the agenda was around the gender-based violence project that Out Saskatoon is still running today. Prior to starting that project, um, I kept thinking that there was an absence of overlap, again, between theory and practice. How can queer theory be writing about undoing gender, ushering in a new politics, while well, I was experiencing deep layers of misogyny as a queer woman working with national partners in relation to, com to SLGBTQ community centers? Uh, how was it that people weren't understanding that homophobia and transphobia themselves are indications of gender-based violence and need to be incorporated into our lenses? Um, and so with that, based on the experiences of the people around me, we applied to the Public Health Agency of Canada to do our own research project, um, to run our own interviews and focus groups, collect the information, run it back by community through town halls, and then let that inform the educational modules and workshops that would be created from the project. Um, and so through, through that process, as I said, it's still ongoing. And so I think, the, I think those education modules now exist and are being taught to community, which is so exciting. Um, but th those early stages, this was... Um, the full experience of, of what it was like to be a community organization fully leading a research project. We didn't have, uh, we didn't have a faculty member. We didn't have, um, uh, we didn't have an academic that was helping shepherd the process. And so we we're working with, a, with Andrew Hartman, a graduate student from psychology who helped to build our ethics proposal. And in that, it was the ethics that really ended up being a large barrier. And I won't go into all of the dirty details, but the big things that came up, which are lessons for later, are that as we, after we applied for the ethics, because um, we wanted to do this in a way that we could publish on this research, the, the ethics board questioned our ability to keep you safe and told us that we were too involved in the research process. 
So number one, questioned our ability to keep youth safe. I know that that's, you know, I know why deep um, ethical guidelines are built in to review boards such as the such as the behavioral ethics review board but in this case it was quite a slight and it felt very hurtful because as a center dedicated to supporting youth um, in fact we we knew that we were the best place to know exactly what youth needed to be kept safe through through the through that process through the interview process or in terms of focus groups and we had we had an elder involved in the process we had counselors on hand um, and so we knew that we definitely had the expertise to be able to do that in a good way um, and then to be told that we were too involved in the research process uh, is also an indication of it's also an indication of the, the biases that continue to exist within the academic environment. Um, it was funny because we said, well, of course we are, we built this, but it indicated that that expectation, you know, we still do rely on the myth of the objective researcher um, and that data has to be separate from community. And that was something that in the process we were really looking to overturn and to show that, that it is this embodied entangled engagement with the work um, and with the data that was going to lend the greatest, um, the greatest insight to what we were collecting. So th that is another talk all unto itself. But we did, we did, we did fight back. We spoke up for ourselves, stood up for ourselves, and really engaged in 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 quite a meaningful conversation with the ethics board. And it resulted in in receiving a written apology from them. And so that you know the power of conversation and and dialogue. But but it still did show me that uh, that. There's, there's still a lot of work to be done in this field. Um, so another barrier, I just have one more barrier, there's, there's many, but was the capacity of staff. Um, and this is something that I'm sure anyone who's done um, research with community has experienced is that uh, nonprofit staff are busy. They are busy, they have work to do, they've got so many, you know, they don't care about you and your research portfolio because they're doing a whole host of other work in the community. Um, they do care, but but it's priorities are so very different, and that's something that we really need to take into account. And and so um, on this one, I think you know, as organizations get bigger, you can you don't all have to be doing the same thing. I remember in the early days of my time at Out Saskatoon, there were only five of us, and so we pretty much all had to be able to answer the phone, write grants, support people that walk through the door, um, plunge the toilet, um, all of those things. But as, as an organization grows, you're able to, to recognize people's unique skills. And so that's something that in that interplay between community and, um, and research scholars, students, that's I think one of the greatest gifts is recognizing and valuing, um, fully valuing the, the unique skills, the competitive advantage that is coming from all parties, all parties, um, because there are things that our community partners can, can do that many academics wouldn't even know where to begin, right? And I think we often, we so often talk about that relationship the other way around. Uh, so those are, those are two big learnings of that. And so from, from those learnings and, and many more in the time at Out Saskatoon, um, I, I started to add a lens to my understanding um, I, of commu what community philosophy and praxis looks like. And so if we think about learning through engagement as a praxis of, of reflexivity, talking and working with reciprocity, building a participatory ethics, accountability. And I'll come back to these. Um, so I did eventually finish that PhD, um, and I don't know how. Um, and then when it came time to leave out Saskatoon, I was I was very lucky to join the College of Law at the University of Saskatchewan. And so I've been I've been with the College of Law for the last two years, um, learning and teaching about human rights and gender and sexuality. 
but one of the first things I did was when I started with, with the college was to get my ducks in a row and build the social innovation lab. And, and so the social innovation lab on gender and sexuality is a shirk funded project. And it is in partnership with, with some incredible folks with Marie Lavrod from women's and gender studies, Caroline, that early mentor of mine, um, coming for full circle to support me, uh, Karen Lawson from psychology and Sarah Buhler from law. And, and so the social innovation lab draws on the, the concept, I'll tell you more about it, but the concept of social innovation, which is probably pretty familiar a term that people hear, um, but just just in case it's new to folks, social innovation refers to new ideas that resolve existing social, cultural, economic, and environmental challenges for the benefit of people and planet. A true social innovation is systems changing. It permanently alters the perceptions, behaviors, and structures that give rise to these challenges. And I, I think I saw some, one of the I'll tell you about the students that are part of the lab later. I think I saw Morgana there. There she is, one of the um, one of the students. So Morgana's heard this story, but I often talk about social innovation in relation to um, the difference. Well, the difference between a tree and a web. So we have this wonderful tree of knowledge. Uh, a tree guides knowledge according to a trunk or roots. So these could be ideas from the past or traditions that we cling to. And then we build upon those through the branches and the nodes. So we start, at a, start an idea and we build, we build a, a robust theory from there. Social innovation is much more like a web um, or a rhizome. The, one of the philosophers that I've, that I've worked on for most of my life is a French philosopher by the name of Gilles Deleuze. And he uses the concept of the rhizome. And so a strawberry is a rhizome, for example. So a strawberry plant could have a, you could have a strawberry plant that pops up here, but it has shoots that run in all directions. And there could be another strawberry plant a mile away that's connected through a root system to that same plant. Um, and so it's not only the web that matters, it's that there isn't a center point. There isn't one strawberry um, that ends up being the, the root, the base, the foundation. Um, a rhizome is non-hierarchical. It's interconnected and interdependent, and it can develop fully, de fully functioning microcosms and offshoots. And so more simply, oh, so here, here's an example of what um, social in a social innovation model um, could include all of these participants. And in so doing, not one is, is kind of valued over and above another because they're all crucial to this process of knowledge formation and understanding. And so, so more simply, social innovation is about co-creating novel solutions to standing social needs. Simple. Um, and it's all around us. Wikipedia, this is the, you know, you can see the little Wikipedia symbol here. Wikipedia is an example of, of social innovation. Um, increasing access to information, uh, so open access to information and publishing. Um, open access copyright movements are also social innovation movements. Crowdsourcing is definitely a social innovation. So this is, I, I don't, I'm sure folks have heard of Access Now, which is a web, an app. I believe it's an app. It's also a website. And so it's, a, it's an app that you can log on to in order to find accessible buildings and services. And the crowdsourcing is that it's, you know, it's all of us that are, so if someone goes to a building that says it has a ramp uh, and you get there and all of a sudden the ramp, it has been removed or it's under construction, you can add that in. And so you can change the story moment by moment. Um, and this is an incredible tool for, for people to, to take ownership um, over, over different models. My partner and I were just daydreaming about a trans healthcare um, app that's crowdsourced or um, uh, gosh, there'd be so many different things, but, but providing the tools for people to share their knowledge and to, and to assess that knowledge together really does give us uh, access to greater information. 
And so thinking about community research as social innovation, I have a, I have a great quote here. And so this is a book that um, there's some really great material out there around community led research. And this one, I don't have it. I just ordered it. Um, it's uh, the book is called community led research and it's based out of Australia. And so this question, what would the research environment be like if rather than researchers coming up with ideas and then trying to work with communities to study them, the community was given the initiative to tell researchers what they want. What if the entire research process was then led from the community level with the researcher placed in a position of facilitator using their expertise not to direct, but to serve community research interests. What a wonderful crowdsourcing flip inversion of, um, of not just community-based research, but even community-based participatory research models. Um, this, this always makes me think about, um, about the process of, of asking first, right? Um, definitely in academic environments, there are ideas that come a mile a minute. And that is because we are in jobs that allow for that, that require that, that expect that. Um, but to think about community-led research, there, there also has to be this part of, of understanding that community centers are not in that same environment, but that doesn't mean there aren't ways, really meaningful ways to facilitate that openness, facilitate those kinds of brainstorming and facilitate community need that is not directed by, um, by the university. So jumping back to those three guiding principles, reflexivity, reciprocity, and accountability, these interventions and inversions helped to shape the social innovation lab and its focus on community led research. And so here just for just to show again what these what these shifts look like. So if we're moving to community community led research so rather than having researchers and students develop ideas and seek community partners to carry out those activities, it looks like community agencies identifying research needs and priorities and researchers helping to facilitate the process. And so that would be as simple as uh, calling up, you know, okay, so there's a big grant out there, um, or for a graduate student, if we have some graduate students, uh, what this could look like is, is thinking about the area that you want to work on. And, and by no means am I saying work on things you're not, you're entirely not interested in, because we all know that when we're working in areas we're entirely not interested in, um, the work suffers. And so the, the reciprocity is that the shared interest is, is really important to the process. And so as a graduate student, you could think, okay, I really want to do something on the queer community, but I don't really know what is, is interesting to them or what's, what are the cutting edge topics. And so rather than doing the, or, you know, rather than reading about it, go ask someone. Uh, and I did have to, I absolutely did have graduate students that did exactly that and came and met with different staff at Out Saskatoon, talked to me and formulated projects um, that way. And, and it was really valuable, that process. And so that's something that students can easily do um, in order to shape what their project looks like. It also looks like uh, so rather than, so, you know, with community research, community members participate in interviews, focus groups, and surveys. It looks like community members helping to frame the questions themselves, developing the surveys, and actually conducting the research itself. Um, and so this is where, again, it requires a level of bravery and courage um, to start thinking about how to reframe those research processes, because some of our in institutions are not are not set up to support this type of work, including our ethics boards that have a lot of questions. When you say a staff member from the organization is going to do the research, they, they're worried about that. They want to know why, what that looks like. Um, and so it does take having those conversations. My experience has been that 
and this is an experience that kind of goes across the board is that people when people say no or when they are afraid or don't understand um so often the easy the easy thing to do is to say okay that's okay we'll come back we'll try this later or to be frustrated um but i would say that that's an opportunity to lean in to try to ask more questions to to see if there is a way through um, because we have found ways through um, just because it's never been done doesn't mean that that it can't be done. So the next piece, so re common phenomenon, researchers publish on research findings in academic journals. Um, the shift is to compute community partners identify needed outputs from research. And this is this is a big one. Um, knowledge mobilization, big buzzword, but it's absolutely vital. Absolutely vital. One of the projects in the Social Innovation Lab right now is so juicy. It's so fascinating. I keep thinking, oh gosh, I want to publish on this. This would make such a great publication. But that's not what the community partner wants. Um, it's a sensitive matter. And it would hurt the steps forward. It's, it's something that is really important to them internally. And so what they want are policy recommendations that can really have an impact on internal HR practices around diversity and inclusion without kind of blowing the lid off. And that's okay. In going, you know, in building up this model where the community leads, that's part of the process is that if they say that we're, that's not what we wanna do, we want to do this instead, you abide by that. And so then this last one, the researchers own the data. Again, this is, this is a terrain that needs, still needs a lot of work, I would say. Um, or the shift is that community partners own the data or shared ownership is negotiated. And so that's, this is a tricky one. Our, our processes really make it difficult um, to enable community ownership and for community ownership of full data. They'll often let you um, uh, give the community completely anonymized data, but there's still, um, there's still that expectation that the, the researcher brings this objectivity that somehow can rise above the fray uh, and somehow can keep that data safer. And so that's something that we need to have many more conversations around. So I have a nice little table just to put it all in one place. Um, but this, so this shift from, and I'm, I'm, I'm simplifying community-based research. I'll definitely acknowledge that. Um, community-based participatory research and other, there's many community-driven research, there's other, many, wonderful folks that are, do I have a little tab thing, that are all, you know, complicated through here. It's so much messier than any chart will ever allow. But there's still, there definitely still does need to be a shift in some significant areas in terms of how we work with our work with and alongside partners. And so as we look at what a community-led research praxis could look like, we return to these concepts of, of reflexivity, reciprocity, and what I'll call social and ethical accountability. And so reflexivity generally is, is, you know, it's the process of examining one's own beliefs or judgments, practices during, through, before, after the research process, and understanding how these influence the research. It's not just Reflexivity is not just about examining our beliefs, it's also about examining and understanding our bodies, ourselves, our identities, our cultural upbringings, sexuality. Um, and so recognizing that all of that plays a significant role, not only in the research, but also in the research relationship. And so I have an example here. This is another um, community project called the P5 or P5 Project YXE. And so um, Dr. Barb Fornsler, who I did my undergrad in women's and gender studies with, and so I am, I am always happy to ampl amplify other, other folks in this work. Um, so this project is uh, focused on um, people with lived and living experiences of substance use. And 
what they have done is deeply incorporated reflexive knowledge into their platform. They have a decision-making group that is made up of community representatives, and they have an advisory group, which is made up of people with lived and living experiences of, of substance use and their family members. And so what that, because it, because it is a really significant research project and they're, they're using interviews and surveys and collecting data about people's experiences, they've ensured that the research team itself is not the decision maker on what, um, what products are created, what, what research steps are taken and what, um, and even the, even the questions that were asked of community. Reflexivity also involves decentering the researchers. And so this is, this is just a, a snapshot of the social innovation lab. Um, but the, the model of the social innovation lab that decenters the researchers is, the, is through the process by which the students are hired without a project, <laughs> is the simplest way to put it. Um, so thanks to partnerships, uh, partnerships with, you can see, many other university departments and programs, we were able to get enough funding to be able to hire what right now it has nine, nine researchers. So three students from law, four MA students, one PhD student, one community researcher. From, um, from law, educational foundation, psychology, Johnson, Johnson Shoyama and women's and gender studies. And so the simple act of having, um, having students employed without having kind of predetermining the outcome, the only outcome is that projects have to do with gender, sexuality and culture. And so really important, great work, but quite broad um, means that we can say to our community partners, what do you want? <laughs> I can call someone up and say, what are you struggling with? What's happening? Do you want to chat? Could we go for coffee? Um, and so it provides the space for community partners to uh, determine what it is that they are looking for. And then what I do is go through the list of wonderful students and mentors and, and kind of figure out who would be best for that project. And sometimes it's more than one person. Um, sometimes I have to rely on the mentorship of, of one of the other collaborators on the grant. Um, and, and by, you know, by hook or by crook, we're, be able, we're able to figure out how to best support that community need. Um, and so that is a process of decentering decentering the university and putting the, putting the ownership and the decision-making in the hands of the community partners. When we look at reciprocity, what this looks like is building resource distri distribution into the grant um, and recognizing the work of community partners. Lots of funds want to see the community part, I mean, pretty much every grant out there, every uh, social sciences and humanities research council grant wants to see extensive community partnership. Um, and it takes work, absolutely it takes work. But what that means is that um, I think from the research side, it means really putting your money where your mouth is and figuring out how the, how the university can support the community, whether it's through money, um, whether it's through hiring a community researcher that then works in that organization. Um, really respecting the work that community partners do means not expecting to do your work for you. And so that's, and the shared responsibilities, right? So sharing, everybody shares in the pie. Um, there, there are a lot, sometimes research grants are significantly better, bigger than a community grant that an organization gets to provide counseling service for a year. And so we need to be taking that into account and really thinking about how we can democratize those processes and ensure that resources are reaching, are, are, are fundamentally built in to our work with community partners because we couldn't do the work without their leadership. And then this timelines one, I'll just show you something. This is, uh, um, I don't know if Momo, one of the other students in the, in the um, social innovation lab is a brilliant 
graphic designer and made this graphic because I keep saying it's, you know, part of working between a massive institution such as the University of Saskatchewan and a community partner is that our timelines are completely different. Many community organizations run on the um, April to March cycle, whereas the U of S, honestly, September to November, that there's a big break and you can see that. So the this is the September to November. I don't, I don't even, oh no, I messed it up. I messed it up. <laughs> this is the wrong way around. Um, so this would be the September to November. I'm not even counting December because everyone's doing exams and nothing happens. This would be January to, to March. And then we have summer terms in here. And honestly, if you want paperwork to get through the university during this time, good luck. But communities don't operate according to that. And so with that ethics um, process that I told you about earlier, um, the ethics process took six, six to eight months. Um, the grant we had, we, according to the grant, we were supposed to get that all done in a year. And so we had to give money back to the funder because the ethics process took too long for us to get things going. Um, and that happens all the time. That happens all the time. Um, the timelines fundamentally do not match up. And so um, in being attentive to that, right, not just as researchers, but advocating on behalf of our community partners to our institutional bureaucracy, that's part of the process is figuring out how, rather than requiring community partners to adhere to our bizarre university timelines, how do we meet them at their timelines? And so then regarding social and ethical accountability, um, oops, this one. Um, so a big part of that um, is focusing on, on social justice and that takes so many different avenues, um, but can include and should include, uh, including anti-racist and anti-oppressive trainings for your team. Um, and so that's, just building it right in to the research process. Um, and if you're a grad student venturing out, um, that part of that reflexivity means recognizing where your gaps are and seeking out that training before starting the research process because it will fundamentally change the way that you both engage with community, the kinds of questions that you wanna ask and the kinds of stories that you wanna tell. Um, following the organization's lead in terms of payments, protocol, and cultural practice. So for example, community partners often pay honorarian cash for good reason. Um, universities require a SIN number in order to pay anyone anything. And so a great way to get around this and to start thinking about how to do it differently is to, to really work with your community partner and ask them if there's a way for them to invoice, right? So that so that funds can get to participants in, in much more accessible ways. Um, because that in itself is a barrier. If, if someone's participation is incumbent upon them providing their SIN number to the university, lots of people aren't going to participate, nor should they have to. Um, and then res responsibility extends beyond the final report. So this is one that um, this is one that requires an extra that a heightened level of accountability and responsibility because I would say that all of those dusty reports that I found in my desk at Out Saskatoon, um, there was a part of me that thought, gosh, I wish that I had read this sooner, or I wish that we could have. I don't know, had a way to share this better with community, um, but we definitely didn't have the capacity or means to do so. And so if there are ways to, you know, we often think that publishing that paper or, or writing that report, that, that good, the relationship is done, we've completed what we were supposed to do, um, and we can move on, when in fact that is just the very, very beginning for community partners. Um, there's so much more that can come from that. And so that leads to uh, and the big piece of social and ethical accountability, which is usable and accessible outputs. Usable and accessible outputs. Call it knowledge mobilization, knowledge translation, um, 
uh, what I, you know, call it all kinds of the end of the logic model, but what it is, is giving people things that they can use. And so here are some, um, so a blog, a policy brief, a social media post, infographics, advocacy letters, there's online forums, there's so many tools that are so much more useful um, than a report. And so I have an example here. I don't know if um, Isabel is on the, on the call, but Isabel McLean is one of the, another one of the researchers with the Social Innovation Lab. And she worked with a national organization called the Enchanté Network to, to write this. It is a report, but it's a wonderfully useful, it's, it's exactly what they wanted. And so it's a, it's a report on um, how funders can better support to us LGBTQ organizations. And so this report has now been shared across the country with funders. Um, and we've already heard that it has made impact and Enchante had the capacity and the expertise to distribute it. And so it ended up being a really valuable piece of policy work for them. Um, but it's, a, it's an example of, of going that one step further and thinking, okay, so we've written this wonderful community report and maybe it means checking in any, in a year and saying, Hey, how's it going? Did you ever find, um, or, or what happened to that? And, and many community organizations, honestly, they'll say, Oh my gosh, I just wish that I could get to it, but I don't have time. Don't be offended. <laughs> That's not about you. The best thing you can do is say, cool, what can I do? Um, or, or think, you know, is there, is there a way that maybe together you could host a lunch and learn and share that information with community? So just some, some, you know, this stuff, I, it's, what is it, Occam's razor, the, the, the best answer is usually the simple, the simple answer, and, and we tend to overcomplicate things, I would say, um, when looking at social and ethical account, accountability in this framework, um, it really is uh, information, sharing information in ways that are accessible, clear, um, and really align with what the community is looking for. That's, that's what's going to make a big splash, um, and that's what's going to make a difference. And that's also what's going to encourage community organizations to trust, uh, to trust the research environment and to continue working together on things. And so that's a big part of the puzzle. And with that, that is all I have to share. And so I would love to hear... That was absolutely amazing. That was that was just phenomenal. Right, right from like I think slide two. I'm like I wrote down a question, so I'm just gonna jump right in and start it off if that's okay. I noticed that your definition of community doesn't include place, and this isn't meant as a criticism, but I'm an environmental historian and and a historian, and so geography and place um, tends to be. Um, one of my first ways that I try and bound or, or describe community. And so the fact that you didn't have any kind of geographical reference, I found that really interesting. Can you talk about that? Yeah, you bet. Um, I, I, I'm definitely a both and kind of a researcher <laughs> in all aspects of my work. And so although I think there's very significant elements in which community is about place. Um, but if we think of the queer community, right, I, I, it's, it's a shifting landscape. And so the two spirit, and, and I mean, in each of those, if I say two spirit, trans, queer, they're both a larger community and also separate communities overlapping, and they definitely are communities that transcend place, um, depending on the scope. Right. And so speak, I would it, it's there's other things that are linking. And so that's a that's the significant part of community is that we are drawn together by many different things and, and we kind of move through different worlds, depending on on which elements we're drawing on at, a, at any given time. It it. it gave me so much to think about. And then as, as we went forward in your presentation and you were talking about um, switching up how we, how, how we think about money, funding, funding opportunities, and to think about it from, can, you, can we 
create a, a pot of money and then and then go to a community and say, okay, what should we be researching? What you know, so have the community sort of put forward their ideas. And again, my my fallback is always place. I'm like, okay, so we're gonna come to the community bigger, which I live in, say, okay, we've got five thousand or five million dollars, um, and and for five year projects, and and the the um, I I could see that the teachers coming forward with the research project around education, and I could see the churches coming forward with some kind of a project around whatever. Uh, I can see the town coming forward with multiple projects. I can see the ag community coming forward. I can see I can see various uh, entrepreneurial, you know, I can see the health. We've got a hospital, you know, small rural hospital. Would they be able to come forward with an opportunity? Would, would the museum, you know, and what would they put in? Would, what would the library want to know? You know, it, it's, and so, and, and then, you know, maybe even drawing from the people itself who live here, maybe they've got other things or interests that they're, that they're uh, you know, thinking about. Could they, you know, uh, ask for money out of that pot. And so it, 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 it sort of, it, it limits by geography, but it still, it kind of opens it up to it because then there's all these ways that these groups could be linking their stuff to each other and, and so on. It's anyway, my brain started to explode in all kinds of ways. So, you know, thanks. <laughs> now I'm going to sit here and go, darn that, I can't see it happening anytime soon. Okay, I'm going to stop talking and open it up to the floor. If you have any questions uh, for Dr. Rachel, or you can either put it in the chat and I will uh, repeat them uh, uh, verbally, or you can simply unmute yourself and away you go. And uh, if you, if we have a crush, then you'll have to start putting up your hands and I'll call on you one by one. Uh, but what a wonderful presentation. Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi there. <laughs> um, I guess my question, thank you so much, Rachel. That was amazing. Um, I guess my question, and I feel like this question has been asked a million times, so it's not an original question, but I'd love your thoughts on it, which is, um, like everything you're suggesting doesn't necessarily align with the metrics that the university uses to, you know, reward um, researchers and academics, um, you know, particularly the example you gave of, you know, like, you know, uh, something that you'd love to publish about, but the community doesn't want it to be published because there's some potential harm involved. I mean, the, the thing that academics are rewarded for is publishing, right? So this can come into tension. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about, <laughs> about that. <laughs> yes, good question. <laughs> Everybody at USAS, close your ears. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it. yeah, I think the honest answer is that uh, the university needs to fundamentally change its metrics. And I, I think you would agree with that. And, and many people would agree with that for many reasons, not just this reason, but also many reasons of equity and gender divisions of labor. So there's lots, lots of conversations around that. Um, but I think, I mean, I, I think that there's kind of a leap um, that we have to take, which, which, and so, I mean, I'm always, my optimistic self is that if we, if we keep building and resisting and pushing and inverting, it will actually change the landscape. And so there is a sense in which we do have to take a leap and, and continue doing things in a good way um, and, and make a fuss about it, right? Um, make a fuss at the university level. But also the other side of that is that I would say um, you know, and I haven't been in the university environment very long um, in this role, but I would say the, the value, the benefit, the relationships with community that grow when, when you yourself are inverting that relationship far outweigh the merit marks. Um, again, coming from someone so new to this game. Um, but that, I think that that's, that's just something that we have to grapple with, right. As, as, as coming from what historically and continues to be a position of power. And so part of that grappling is figuring out how, what we can live with and what we can do differently. Um, that still takes care of ourselves, but also recognizes the, the central role that our community partners pay, play in moving any of our work forward. Chantel, thank you very much for that great 
answer to that great question, by the way. <laughs> Chantel, go ahead. I guess I have a question that's related to Sarah's and maybe a question for um, potential around a social innovation lab um, project. And that is around um, whether or not it would, there could be a community led um, research project that could be presented to the university mm -hmm. to address some of the things that Sarah has raised um, as an agency that often will be the flow through so that we can give um, participants money without asking for a whole bunch of invasive information. Um, I just wonder if one, the powers that be even know that that happens because yeah. it's always when your community doing research in partnership with university, oftentimes you're the one that gets the labor, like extra labor um, to do workarounds around the bureaucracy. But I wonder if ever there's been a report um, scripted by community around mm -hmm. these things to, for universities to consider changing um, some of their metrics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a very good idea. Let's the three of us strategize about how to do that. <laughs> I do think that's a really good idea, um, you know, and sometimes they land, sometimes they don't, but telling the story and indicating why is, is a big, it helps and, and it's a big part of it um, in terms of pushing things forward. And also this is, this is not I mean, models like this are happening all over the world. Um, the concept of the research shop, which is what first I stumbled upon. And I think it's a model in the UK, which is a, a research center that has a bunch of graduate students. They apply for positions and undergraduate students. And so they work there um, and, and then community can access them for different projects. So whether it's an evaluation, whether it's a program evaluation, whether it's a, a policy project. And so it's, I think, looking into those models and, and seeing what other places have done and how they have addressed issues such as merit and what it looks like on both sides, I think um, are helpful in terms of the, moving this conversation forward. One example that we have at the University of Saskatchewan is the History Collaboratorium, um, where the students are trained, you know, at, by by sort of the, the the university. But it's the community that comes to the university with a project, and they've got funding to hire a student, but they'd really rather have someone else sort of overseeing the technicalities of the project. And so there's always a number of communities, and and community uh, defined quite broadly. It can be a physical community, it can be uh, an entity of some kind, a nonprofit entity. Have they often come forward over the past I think it's been running for about five or six years Ooh. and uh, yeah and so the students get about two weeks of training and then and then they're they they work together sort of in the same space so they can ask each other questions and kind of you know refer to each other but then there's there's a, a graduate student that sort of oversees their work they tend to be undergraduate students who who work at the collaboratorium and then they report back to the community and it's the community who who owns who owns the data and and brings and sets the research question and brings it forward Very so cool. yeah it's it's so we we have made some inroads at, at u of s mm -hmm. but it's nice to build on those and and expand that uh, model out a little further Mm -hmm. Absolutely. If there are other questions, Heather says, thank you for your insight and great presentation. Yes, absolutely. Welcome. I love how people just sort of um, show up on video and then they unmute themselves like, hi, I'm here. <laughs> I'm going <laughs> to ask a question. <laughs> Dr. Rachel, while we're waiting for, for, for any, any final questions that might come in, any final thoughts? What's the one thing you want all of us to, to take away from your, your talk today? Oh, wow. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Dr. Jaime is here. Dr. Lavalle, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> You're welcome. Did you have a question? No. Okay, <laughs> just check it. <laughs> Morgana says, thanks, Rachel and Merle, for setting this up. I wish it could stay longer. These questions are so interesting. Wishing everyone a good evening. Yes, thank you, Morgana. So one big thing. This is something that I, I do in my classes sometimes. Like, what's the one big thing yeah. you want people to remember? Gosh, 
Let me think, let me think. <laughs> I think, I mean, I think that it's, it's not enough to recognize and acknowledge the power differentials. That's not enough. We do that. We know how to do that. I think there's, you know, and those happen between universities and community agencies, between communities and groups. I think the work is of actually inverting it, <laughs> actually finding ways not just to say, yes, we know power, power dynamics exist, but what can we do to actually flip those power dynamics and, and ensure that community organizations can operate from, from a place of power, from a place of access, um, because that is what's gonna help to start change the conversations. And it's, and it's not easy, <laughs> but that would be, you know, kind of going beyond that acknowledgement to the, that action. Well, I think as a final thought, that is a very intuitive one, and that is a great insight. Thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. The community is stronger because of the inversion. Absolutely, Cheryl. We agree with that as well. Um, thank you very much for being with us. I will stop the recording, and um, thank you, everyone, for joining us, and thank you for all your great questions.